out. Truth remains. Truth doesn't go away. The grave dug into the rock did not lock Jesus in. We saw that in the picture before. The stone was rolled away. I want to read the story in Matthew to all of us this evening. Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10. This Easter story. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to see the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid. He said, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see the place where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him and grasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid, go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. I delighted in reading some comments about this in a salt called Salt Commentary. I'm using some of the inspiration that I gathered there and sharing it with you tonight. For often we read the Easter stories and we assume that the women came to the tomb because they think Jesus is dead and they want to add their spices for the burial of his body. For Matthew, the women come to the tomb because they think Jesus is or soon will be alive which I thought was a very interesting turn on the story. Could it be true, I wondered, that some of the disciples really caught the words of Jesus? He had always talked about his death with this addition. He said, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. On the third day. Perhaps it's worthwhile to consider that some people maybe heard those words. And even though they were not sure what they meant, they went away from the cross without total hopelessness. If this can be so, then it is also, I think, a path for us to take even now. Jesus' words about the future, and you can read them often in Matthew 25 and other places. Sometimes we read those words about the future, which Jesus has spoken, and we are not quite exactly sure what they mean. But we have hope in this story that his words at some point will be worked out in real time. That allows us to maintain the spark of joy, even in dark places and spaces. Let's look at the clues Matthew includes, which suggests that these women anticipated something beyond their comprehension. Matthew tells us that the women showed up not to embalm the corpse, but rather to see the tomb. 
The word used to see means to look at, also to discern, to contemplate, to analyze, to understand. Out of the Greek word comes the English word for theater, an art form where dramatic action is seen in order to help everyone concentrate on a meaning of something so as to better understand it. I think many of you who were at the Easter Garden this past week or so had a touch of that to watch and participate in a live narrative, a live story, a theater piece, enables us to understand. It brings the message home. And many people who went to the Easter Gardens, whether it was here in Stuttgart or Pforzheim or somewhere else, grasped more of the meaning of the story about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And so these two Marys come, I like that name, Mary, it's not bad. <laughs> and can we imagine for a moment, putting all the other stories aside in our mind, that they expect some dramatic action to happen. They expect something. In Matthew's Gospel, shortly before this story, the two women are specifically mentioned the male disciples of Jesus betray, deny, and desert Jesus at the crucifixion in Matthew's account. The two Marys, if you read the section right before this section, are witnesses, it says. And note what is said in Matthew 27, 55 and 56. And many women who had come from Galilee with Jesus to care for him, were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. To care for, to provide here, means to furnish essential resources for Jesus in that last week at least. And often in other scriptures, they were there often providing for Jesus and the disciples. And it's the same word Matthew uses for giving food to the hungry and drink to the thirsty in the last chapter, Matthew 25, where you can feed the hungry, take care of the poor. That's the same word. These two Marys were devote, devoted followers of Jesus. They were learning from him and providing for him. And here I quote, and it's not to put any of the men down, by the way, it's in the story. They said, when the male disciples lose their nerve and run for the hills, the women stay and see. That's the last part of the quote. They remain near. Now, we could say there are many reasons why the men had to disappear more quickly. They were more apt to be snatched by the authorities than the women. I presume that to be true. Nonetheless, the women stayed around. And what do these women do? According to Matthew, at the very moment Jesus dies, the earth shook and tombs opened, and they're witnesses to the very things. Isn't it amazing that just a few days and a few verses before our text, these two women witness unbelievable signs. According to the witness of the Roman centurion, which causes him to say, truly this man was the son of God. Remember the centurion said that when he saw all of these things happen. And these women were witnesses to these things. And it's good for us to remember, these women have been following Jesus all along. They were familiar with his teachings, that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering and be killed and on the third day be raised. Three times Matthew makes that statement in his gospel. 
three times. And these women apparently were listening up to what he had to say. I was thinking it is possible that they could hear it more than their brothers. Because remember that sometimes the male disciples got themselves tied into knots about who was the greatest, who would be on the right side and the left side of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom, who would get power to share with him. And they were even asking how many swords should be gathered for the conflict. The women perhaps being more powerless, I would say, in this context. And perhaps that made them more attentive to other details. And remember, the other Mary had even sat at Jesus' feet to take in every word. And Mary Magdalene had been set free by Jesus from all kinds of troublesome demons, whatever was troubling her soul. Jesus opened up the way, you could say, for many of the women to become what they were meant to be. And at this point in Jesus' life, they weren't going to walk away. And they had listened up. And so it seems that they come in this morning with expectation. Expectation. Minus embalming spices, according to Matthew. Now, there's other, the other Gospels write some different tidbits, but I think it's very significant that Matthew doesn't put that in here. Interesting. Makes us think maybe a bit more about the story. They don't expect to use the spices. Why? Because they haven't given up on God yet. And they assume Jesus just very may rise. Something might dramatically happen. They don't know what, but they want to be ready. They came to see the tomb. A daring hope of some sort. I kind of think this is the way we need to live our Christian lives, with daring hope. To be expecting something, where there could be some joyful possibilities that we have not thought of yet. Because Jesus is there in the story. And right in their presence, once again, another great earthquake takes place. And it shakes the stone away from the tomb. And on top of that, what happens? An angel appears in a lightning form, clothed white as snow, and sits on the stone. The women don't seem overwhelmed, but awestruck. Like, wow, what a thing to see. I happen to be present. And they are overjoyed. And contrast that with all of the soldiers. Can you imagine? They have been told to guard the tomb. Don't let anyone steal the body. Stay guard, stay ready, be ready to defend things here. And what happens? When the earthquake happens and the angel appears, what happens to the soldiers? They fall over into a dead faint. I wish all the soldiers on the face of the earth at this present moment would fall over in a dead faint. Wouldn't that be a victorious, wonderful thing? I wonder if that's something Jesus could bring about, that soldiers would stop fighting and fall over because they've been made aware of something beyond themselves. Wouldn't that be joyful? It's amazing in itself. Imagine the soldiers are lying around, the brightness of heaven shining in angel form, and these women see it. They see it. I wonder if they talked to Matthew about it later. He wasn't there. Somebody had to inform Matthew about this. The commentary says they meet the angel's gaze. They see what they came hoping and expecting to see. Not a dead body to embalm, but an empty tomb. And now the story continues. The angel gives him a confirmation. Yes, you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified, but he isn't here. 
He is risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Jesus' words are true, and the theme of this day is truth remains. His words remain truthful. He hasn't lied to his disciples. His words are true. He said, I would die, but I will rise on the third day. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish and was spit out on the third day, guess what? That's happening to me. And he fulfilled his promise. He fulfilled his words. His words are truthful. And then he tells the two women, take a good look for yourself. See where he was lying and is no more. Can you imagine taking a peek into the empty tomb? That might have been a little spooky. But they see precisely what the angel said. And we know in other contexts the grave clothes were kind of laying there, but no body. And then the angel gives them an assignment. He commissions them. He says, go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee and in Galilee you will see him there. And remember what I've told you. See for yourself and then go and tell. They are given apostolic work to do. For the original meaning of apostles is a person sent forth. So these women are commissioned to go and tell. And you know what's interesting? They don't hesitate. I wonder if they had their jogging shoes on or their jogging sandals. Because they immediately take off running away from the tomb. Running away from it. Before we go on here, it's significant for us on Easter to take a clear position with these women ourselves. To see the tomb and say it's empty. A clear signal, Jesus is no longer dead. He's no longer dead. The tomb is empty. We don't have to stay locked in grief, this is the other part, over what Jesus did for us on the cross. I think we need to always honor what Jesus did for us on the cross, but not be locked in grief. Rather, we need to run and tell that the grave is empty. Jesus is alive. Go with the good news. Jesus is alive, and what's more, you will see him too. And I think this is for all of us a clear thing. You will see him too. We can know Jesus alive ourselves today. We can get in contact with this living Lord. It's not just pre, 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 a hundred years, two hundred, a thousand years, two thousand years ago. If Jesus is alive, then he can be met today. That's the truth of the Easter story. And you know what the women do? They don't stand around and say, well, I wonder if that could be true. That would be a a thing we might do. We might say, well, I don't know. Let's hang around the tomb a little longer and see if anything else happens. No. They are obedient to the angel's command and they run and go. They have a blend of emotions, frightened and filled with joy. There's an awe about all of this. And can you imagine it? I mean, I don't understand how they could contain themselves. The earthquake in itself would shake me loose, and then the angel coming as a lightning force on the stone, and then the assignment from the angel to run, and the, the uh, soldiers are frozen on the ground, and I wonder how long it took them to wake up. The women looked at each other in amazement, and they took off. I think that's cool. Just like sometimes you get excited about something, and you look, at your friend or your partner or your son or daughter and say, let's go, let's do it. And they run. They rushed, the Bible says, to give the disciples this message. They weren't expecting any more. They had gone to the tomb to see and they had received what they expected 
an empty tomb. And then all of a sudden, who shows up right in front of them? Jesus. Jesus meets them and greets them. That must have been like having whipped cream on top of the cake. Not in Galilee where the rest of the disciples will meet him. No, right when they're running to go tell. A direct encounter with a living Jesus. Isn't that marvelous? And now they run to him. And they grasp his feet. And they worship him. Instead of embalming dead feet, they take hold of his live, warm feet. Imagine that. The body that they had witnessed being wounded and tortured and killed is now pulsing with life. The body fully alive. What a thing. What a thing. Does that get you excited here today? It should. We maybe have to grasp it a bit, but we maybe should do some dancing and throwing up our hands in holy joy. He's fully alive, pulsing with life. And the two Marys bless the resurrected body here in Matthew's gospel. They worship him in their devotion. And then once again, Jesus commissions them. Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. By calling them brothers, Jesus has clearly forgiven them. He wants to be with them and he really wants to restore them as we read in other gospel passages. Jesus isn't interested in condemning us for our hesitancy, for our denial, for our running away, for being scattered, all the things that happen to us. Jesus is interested in restoring the relationships with us that have been broken so we can have communion and fellowship together. And once again, the women just take off. Easter Sunday begins something brand new. We now have 50 days to celebrate and try to grasp this mystery. It takes time. It takes time for all of us to understand, if we can at all, the resurrection. The women arrive on the first day of the week. It's a beginning. Easter Sunday is not the end of Lent. It's the beginning of a whole new Easter time. And in a deeper way, it's the beginning of our active, alive Christian faith. We live our lives in the light of the resurrection. So we should blow a trumpet. Anyone have one here? We should let the lilies bloom or other wonderful flowers bloom. It's like a kickoff Sunday, a launching of a new day, a day of resurrection joy. The two Marys may have had mixed emotions and maybe they were a bit afraid. How would their brothers respond to their message? Maybe that's why Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go and tell them anyway. Maybe they thought, ah, they might not believe us quite. <laughs> Whatever, they proclaimed the mystery and announced the good news. And let's hear these last words from this commentary, which I thought was phenomenal. Easter Sunday, what the good, what's the good news of the gospel today? For those who despair that death-dealing powers have the upper hand, fear not. Easter means that God ultimately is and will be victorious over the powers of death. For those who feel isolated and lonely, fear not. Easter means we are all together in the risen body of Christ, even if we're physically apart. For those who despair that our guilt is too great for God to forgive, fear not. Easter means God has cleared all counts, liberating humanity from shame, reconciling us to God and each other as God's children. For those who despair in the midst of pain or anguish, take heart. 
You are not alone. Jesus suffers with you in solidarity and companionship. And Easter means you will rise with him. For those who despair over a world filled with hate, violence, and scapegoating, that's sometimes me. I'm on the edge sometimes of despair about our, our world. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. In Christ's passion, God has taken the place of the scapegoat in order to expose humanity's violent ways. And Easter means God will one day overcome violence. Isn't that good news? Amen. Yeah, amen. Indeed, Easter means that God has taken one of the worst things in the world, the Roman cross, and remade it into one of the best the tree of life, a sword into a plowshare, and if the worst, then also the whole creation in the end. Like the cross, the empty tomb is a great divine mystery, a rising sun dispelling shadows in multiple directions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.